Yeah, I will be basically talking about how explosions uh, shape galaxies. And uh, to understand that, what, uh, where, what I worked on is a computer simulations of uh, galaxies, in which I tried to understand how galaxies form and how they evolve. And for this, I use very big uh, <coughs> computers. So, a supercomputer is basically an uh, agglomeration of uh, thousands of personal computers that gives you a lot of uh, calculation power to do very good calculations and simulations to understand how galaxies uh, form. And compared to just observing the universe, you can actually see how galaxies evolve in, in time. Mm -hmm. uh, simulation. So a simulation, what is that? So in practice, a simulation is just you have a bunch of particles, and you just put in a bunch of physics laws, and you let the particles follow these physics laws, and then you yeah, simulate something. And this can be basically anything that you want. You can simulate an uh, airplane, uh, how things fall on the ground, uh, galaxies, which you can also simulate things related to molecules or biological uh, things. So it's very broad what you can do with simulations. And in my case, I do simulations of how galaxies form. And to do that, we need a few pieces of essential physics. So we'll shortly show the, the six pieces of essential physics that's basically we need the model of the universe that uh, basically says uh, as how much matter is there, matter of what kind is there, how does the universe expand. And we need a model for fluid dynamics that basically means how do the particles move in our simulations that they showed in the previous uh, slide. Uh, then we have a model for radiative cooling of a heating of gas that basically describes how the temperature of gas in the, in the simulation and the universe, how that evolves, um, yeah, how uh, yeah, radiation is uh, cooling down the gas. Then we need to actually form stars if you want to study galaxies. And to that, we basically need to include star formation, so how to convert gas to stars. And for that, we basically put in some kind of mathematical equation to basically form from gas stars. And then, uh, if you have stars, then you have can form galaxies, but it's not the whole picture. You also need uh, something called stellar evolution, how uh, stars evolve, uh, what happens at the end of their life, that they, for example, explode uh, in some cases. And you also need something called uh, black holes, so you also need to include uh, black holes in, in your simulation uh, yeah, to make a realistic uh, universe. So we'll talk shortly about these different components. So there is this amazing telescope called the Planck Observatory uh, and it took like this a uh, nice picture and uh, it seems a bit of a random picture but if you take statistics of this picture you can very accurately determine what the universe is made of and how it will expand. And so conclusion from this picture is the universe consists mainly of dark energy, 25% uh, of dark matter and only 4% out of the matter that we are made of like atoms. So we have no clue what dark energy and dark matter is, but if you want to study galaxies, you just need to assume this. So we just assume there's dark energy and there's dark matter. So that's basically our model of the universe. Uh, the next thing is that we need a model of fluid dynamics. So we can actually test, uh, do a simple experiment on computer fluid dynamics. So here blue and red is two fluids that move with a different velocity. And if you have two fluids that move with a different velocity, you get like a kind of curl structures, which we call vortices. And, uh, yeah, uh, and they basically uh, shape like this. And you can compare how this compares with uh, uh, real life. So there is this uh, amazing place in the world called the Amazon forest. And you have two rivers there, called the Rio Negro and the Sonomois River and they basically collide and they have a different velocity so the black river here only has a velocity of 2 km an hour and uh, the brown one of 10 km an hour and you basically see the same structure as, do, as you do in the simulation up here so you can really test your model of fluid dynamics on problems on Earth so that is uh, the fluid dynamics component the next component is basically you need to do radiative cooling and for this you just ask uh, some people that do atomic physics or molecular physics to basically calculate how, we, um, how particles like atoms and molecules, how they radiate away energy and the energy that's radiated away that is basically also cools down uh, the material so this also you just put in your model 
So then the next thing is star formation. So star formation <laughs> is an ongoing battle between gravity and pressure, in which gravity basically wants to form stars. Pressure wants to prevent this, but in the end it's always gravity that wins. <laughs> so um, in the end you always form stars. So with these four components you can basically already form galaxies. Uh, but there is a problem. So I showed this amazing plot which I made in paint, is that if you have the amount of galaxies as a function of the mass of galaxies, and we put in this curved model in red, you get this line. But then if we look at the observations of galaxies in the universe, we get this blue line. So we don't at all agree with uh, yeah, the observations. So we have a problem here and there, and we need to solve that. And for, to solve a problem in galaxies, you need a lot of energy. So <clears throat> we basically need some uh, explosions in the simulations to, to solve this uh, problem. So I will give a short introduction about explosions. So here you have a beautiful explosion uh, from an atomic bomb in 1953. And you basically see that uh, hot gas is going up and forms like this uh, very beautiful rotating uh, structures um, and this is basically one of the main things of explosions but the first feature of explosions you probably didn't see because it went too fast so if we just look at the fixed time of an explosion you see this very small shell so that is the shock wave that puts a lot of energy so if you would be standing there you would be basically blown away by that shock wave additionally we have the, the mushroom cloud which is basically hot air rising and then when it reaches the top it interacts with cold gas and basically starts cooling down and goes down and you get this rotation and it starts rising because it's hot and additionally you also have cold gas because of the, the big movement of the hot gas it's basically sucked in so you can get very hot gas uh, can bring cold gas to very high uh, heights in the earth atmosphere but can also be uh, apply to galaxies. So, uh, you, in the case of galaxies, you have this phenomenon called core collapse supernova. So, if you have a very massive star, at a certain point becomes a red uh, supergiant, and at a certain point it runs out of uh, nuclear fuel, and it basically starts losing its pressure, it starts to collapse, and that is basically the core starts to collapse, and uh, then when it gets very dense, it basically rebounds, and you get an enormous explosion. This is called a supernova, and specifically the core collapse supernova. So that is, uh, yeah, formed by very massive stars. And if you look at the uh, individual galaxy, you can see very bright points uh, like this in galaxies that are a supernova. So then the next thing is how much energy uh, does an exploding star release compared to, for example, um, yeah an atomic bomb or just in dual or compared to the energy consumption of people anyone has an idea already gave some hints uh, in a supernova in, in, in a, a supernova yeah how much energy more than the entire what more than the entire universe combined no like no. For, for a, for a fraction light. of a second if you took a fraction of a second is the, the light or something like that combined all the stuff. Yeah, yeah, but how much energy are we talking about? A lot. So, I'll just give some numbers. So, it's 10 to the 30 times more. So, that is a 1 with 30 zeros. More powerful than a, a standard atomic bomb. A 1 with 44 zeros of joule. It's actually a 1 with 23 times the annual global energy consumption of the world. And you basically, if you would consume this energy as Earth, you actually need a 1 with 13 zeros of amount of planets to consume all this energy for the age of the universe. So it's an enormous amount of energy that we're talking about. So, um, how does exploding stars uh, influence galaxies? So basically, if you have a disk galaxy, explosions, they basically happen in the, in the disk, and they throw away in this mushroom cloud fashion uh, gas out of the galaxy, 
and this gas basically starts going away and it can also fall back on the galaxy. And this happens basically all the time and because it removes gas from the galaxy, this gas cannot form any stars. So you basically reduce the amount of stars that can form in this galaxy. So I have a simulation that basically shows this. Um, this. And this is a, from the top of the galaxy, so you see blue gas that is basically cold gas in the galaxy. You see all kinds of red blobs in the galaxy. And this is basically formed by a supernova that form holes in the galaxy. And uh, yeah, you see all, also some uh, cold gas in black that goes towards the galaxy in a way. And if we then look from the side of the galaxy in a minute, you see that the galaxy basically throws out all kinds of cold gas. And there's some cold gas going in, some cold gas going out. And you also see that there is sometimes hot gas rising um, in, in different directions. And this can, you can see a bit better if we zoom out a bit more even uh, in, in a minute. Um, then, then you can see here that um, yeah, you see a shock wave of an explosion. Uh, and you see all uh, next shock waves, but you also see that the gas can go very far away from the galaxy. And here you can see more clearly some gas is still going away and other gas is still uh, falling back uh, towards the, the galaxy. So yeah, these core collapse supernova, they really can get rid of gas uh, in the galaxy. And if we then go back to the picture of uh, comparison with observations and uh, our model, if we then do this model, but we also include core collapse, you see that we get a much better match at, with the observations by just including the core collapse. And this match with observation is very good then at the low mass of uh, small galaxies. But then we still remain with the issue here. And to solve that, we need to yeah, include something uh, even nicer. And that is that we will need to include supermassive black holes, or sometimes called active galactic nuclei. So this is basically in the center of uh, all galaxies, you have a black hole, but they're very massive. The black hole gets very massive, like uh, a billion times the mass of the sun. And this around this black hole, there is basically gas that is being accreted, and this black hole basically. Uh, shoots away uh, gas in opposite directions. And if you have um, these jets of a lot of uh, energetic particles, if they collide with something, you basically deposit energy in a very small volume. And if you have a lot of energy in a very small volume, that just means that you have an explosion. So you basically produce uh, explosions uh, this way too in the, in the simulation. So we can actually look at, uh, at the simulation of this. Um, so here, I basically show a very massive galaxy. And you see this uh, very clearly shock waves all the time in all the direction. But you also see hot bubbles. These are basically the mushroom clouds uh, going uh, away from the center, which is here. And it brings a lot of cold gas. So you see a very uh, cold gas all the way here. And yeah, you see really that the hot bubbles are followed by cold gas. And sometimes the hot bubbles, they even push cold gas out. So that is basically um, how in the massive galaxy, cold gas is removed from the, from the center of, uh, of galaxies. But you also form a lot more cold gas at a uh, larger rate. So if you then include uh, supermassive black holes and also the core collapse, you get a much better agreement at this part of the curve. So at the very massive, the giant galaxies, you have uh, a nearly perfect agreement, but still some slight uh, mismatch. So to even solve this mismatch further, there is even a other type of uh, star um, that is called, uh, now explosion is called the supernova type 1a. Then if you, for example, have two old stars here, and they start rotating, and at a certain point, they, um, they collapse and they form uh, this other type of supernova called the supernova type 1A and they release a lot of energy and these they um, yeah, can also uh, put a lot of energy in certain types of galaxies they happen in all galaxies 
but they are the most important in the most massive galaxy. So now it will explode and release like a lot of energy. So if you include this, it basically suppresses the star formation in massive galaxies or delays the star formation in massive galaxies. And if you then look at the curve, you get almost near perfect agreement. So you include two components there to make the agreement even better. And um, yeah, then you also solve the, the problem over there and you get like yeah, very good agreement uh, with this observation line. So the take home uh, message is uh, as follows. If you have these work, small galaxies, they're influenced by explosions of the, the big stars that uh, produce core collapse supernovas. And if you look at the giant galaxies, they're mainly influenced by the supermassive black hole and also by these old uh, binary stars uh, that merge. And to, to summarize this in, uh, in this uh, figure, the same figure, it basically looks like, like that you have the, the massive uh, stars exploding and then there you have the supermassive black hole and the binary old stars. So, um, if anyone has questions, feel free to, to ask them. Very, and then 
actually they don't really know how this works, but you get uh, the particles, they don't even enter the black hole, but they're uh, shooting the opposite direction. Probably has to do with the, the, the spin of the, the black hole in this direction. They don't necessarily even go out of the, this galaxy, they don't go perpendicular, they go in any other direction. As long as it's the, along the, the spin axis of the, the black hole. So if it rotates like this, it's, it goes in this direction along your top. So with this model, you've expanded it using some extra factors, and it improved the fit using the observed data. Were there also factors you considered which didn't match the observed data? Well, I, I don't understand the, the question. Can you? Yeah, we can. I, I also cannot hear very well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you've added these factors, and they help improve the consistency between the model and the actual observed, observed data. Yeah. Have you also considered factors which didn't improve this, um, which didn't improve the correlation, like they made the model worse? Uh, yeah, well, of course these are also there. You, you need to, to work a lot on the implementation of how you do uh, this type of uh, explosions in the simulation. So there are certain uh, things that are unsure in this and that you need to test in order to, to get a good match. But this is also not the, the whole picture. You have uh, also some other things. Yeah. yeah, if I can ask a follow-up question, is that yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. Then yeah, how do you make sure it's not like overfitting, where you change like you change your assumptions based on if it's the model better? Yeah. Now, what, what, what you do in practice, we just fit, uh, yeah, we make a model, uh, and then we fit it to just one or two curves, and then we don't say we predict this, we calibrate on this. Okay. And the, the, thing, the other things we, we call collating simulation, we call that predictions. Uh, that is how we normally uh, do that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, in one of the simulation r results, we saw the the, the galaxy from the side where it was flat, yep. and the gas filling out mostly uh, to, to above and, and below. Is that uh, just for this one instance? Because I can also imagine if, if explosion goes more to the side, that it stays more contained in the galaxy, or how? Oh, it yeah, goes. so there's two types of galaxies. You have like circle galaxies, then it can be any direction. You have disk galaxies. Then you have a lot of resistance in the disk. So if you shoot something in the disk, uh, or you get an explosion that propagates in the disk, you actually don't see it because there's a little ma matter in the way. So actually, it wants to have the direction of least resistance, so it goes perpendicular to the, to the disk. That is why in this, if you have a disk, you basically always see uh, outflows or yeah, clouds going in along this uh, direction. Yeah. Yeah. One last question. Here. So you mentioned that um, the direction of the jets is because of the, the spin of the black hole, but you don't know this spin. So how do you deal with this in your simulations? Basically, how do you set the direction of the black hole jet? And does it matter also? No. In, in my case, I don't assume anything about the jet direction. Uh, my implementation is that you just uh, spherically heat uh, gas around it. And then still, despite you do it spherical, you get like one of the outflows. So you don't put anything like this in it. But I also work on a model uh, with one of my collaborators <coughs> that basically you shoot jets uh, along the spin axis. But then it gets more complicated because then you need to keep in mind uh, every time in the simulation you need to see yeah, what is the, the angular momentum of the gas that you, you have read uh, to, to keep updating the, yeah, the, the spin axis of the black hole. So it gets more complicated uh, that way. And it's not even necessarily better in that way. Okay.